Now we're to our final panelist, and then soon we're going to turn to you. Craig Thorne is going to continue the discussion of geographical indications. And Craig is a partner at DTB Associates, which is a prominent trade consulting firm here in town. Craig? Okay, who's going to help me get my PowerPoint presentation back here? Can't even open the laptop. Okay, here she comes. Just Allison. Ah, here we go. Thank you. That, that was much easier than I expected. Okay. Uh, the uh, I'd like to thank the previous two speakers for doing part of my job. I was going to give you a little bit of basic background on this issue of geographical indications. I don't need to do that anymore, so I'm going to use my remaining nine minutes and 50 seconds to talk to you about, to, to, to try to clear up some misconceptions, I guess, to uh, try to define for you what I see as the battle line on, on, on this issue in the TTIP negotiations, and maybe to uh, define a little bit of uh, what could become common ground. I don't have to go through this definition for you because I think you've already seen uh, the, the WTO definition of a geographical indication. It's already been pointed out, too, that this isn't just a European phenomenon. Uh, there are familiar European GIs like uh, Parmigiano Reggiano, Mozzarella di Bufala Campagna, uh, but there are also U.S. GIs. We've got a couple of them listed here. And there are people in the U.S. that, that care a lot about having the right to protect their GIs or their collective marks or however their, uh, their names are registered around the world. And it may surprise you to hear me, my, my clients, uh, the, the people who I, who I represent uh, on this issue are often uh, represented as opponents of GIs. But one of the first points I want to make in this discussion is that GIs are a legitimate form of intellectual property. And I can say that without uh, any fear of upsetting the, the people that I represent on this issue. They believe that too. It's, this isn't about whether or not GIs are a legitimate form of intellectual property. Their goal in this negotiation isn't to pr prevent the registration of GIs. And in fact, we recognize that every country in, that is a, a member of the WTO has the obligation under the uh, WTO TRIPS agreement to provide for the registration of GIs. It's been mentioned already in the discussion that different countries provide protection in different ways. And I think it's unfortunate that, that this difference in systems has been uh, really the focus of the international debate for the past 15 or I guess 17 years since the WTO agreements went into place. Uh, the U.S. uses its trademark system, the EU and other countries use sui generis systems. Frankly, uh, we're, we're agnostic on the issue of which system is better because either system can be used in a, in a way that protects our interests or hurts our interests. It's a question of how uh, registration and enforcement are carried out. I want to say, too, that uh, we recognize that G GIs can add value to products. They can be a branding platform. If the policy is implemented in the right way, they can act as a sort of a quality guarantee to, to consumers. Uh, they can protect names from misuse. We recognize that it's important to have a system in place that ensures that consumers aren't misled as to the true origin of the product. However, and here's where we start to get to the nub of the issue, some, pro, uh, uh, some approaches to GI protection can unnecessarily create, can, can create unnecessary trade disruptions, also domestic problems. This all has to do with the scope of protection that is granted to GIs and to the problem of registration of names that have already entered the public domain become common names or generic names. There's also, there are also uh, 
frequent problems with trademark infringement. Now, let's get to the EU system. Uh, under the EU system, uh, we, we know that it's, uh, it's an ambitious system, that, that the EU has read, uh, registered literally thousands of names. Most of these names are not at all problematic. Uh, however, under the EU system, and the system that the EU has been working hard to export to other countries through trade agreements over the past few years, protection of a geographical indication often extends to the individual components of that GI. So not just Provolone Valpadana, but Provolone. Uh, or the derivative terms, not just Parmigiano Reggiano, but Parmesan. The EU also protects some single names with no geographical component, feta, which is uh, a cheese name that's reserved for the entire country of Greece but can't be used by any producer that's producing outside of, of Greece. Many such terms are names that are commonly used throughout the world. Uh, we're talking mainly about cheeses and meat products, but not just cheeses and meat products. The names have been used for generations by, mainly by descendants of, of European immigrants. And uh, they have become traditional names for types of food, uh, types of Western foods mainly, in different parts of the world. And I list a couple of examples here. I just uh, listed these off the top of my head. Cheddar, uh, it's a type of cheese. Uh, now, uh, th this is a, a cheese that's considered, a type of cheese that's considered generic in the EU, and I want to talk about that issue in just a minute. Uh, but uh, that, it's a good example of a cheese that was originally produced in one geographical region in Europe. There is a town called Cheddar, but it's now come to be known as, uh, understood as a type of cheese. Mozzarella, pizza, it's a food product originating in Italy. But uh, it, I think a lot of people would be upset if they lost the right to use the, the name pizza to describe what they were making and selling in their restaurant. Spaghetti, hamburger, it's a place name. Driv it, uh, the Hamburg is a place in uh, a city in Germany, as you know. Frankfurter, I tried to come up with a couple of non-food examples. Uh, these are the only two I come up with uh, just off the top of my head. China, uh, place name, but it's also a common name for porcelain dinnerware. Afghan. I don't know exactly what an Afghan is. It's knitted something. But it's, it's, a, it's a name of a product now. Uh, and, and nobody is confused when they buy China into thinking that it originated in China, or when they buy or knit an Afghan into thinking that it was imported from Afghanistan. And many of these common names have been incorporated into valuable brand names. One of the groups that uh, is active on this issue is the Grocery Manufacturers Association. Those food companies that are members of that organization will tell you that the most valuable asset they have is their brand names. Rebranding is an extremely expensive proposition. And they don't want to, uh, they, they really don't want to have to go around the world and rebrand all of their products. And, they, and this has never been an issue before before the last few years, uh, because they never thought that they needed to incorporate into their trademarks these names of, of common foods. And let me give you an idea of what we're talking about in terms of production. Uh, just listed a few cheese names here. The uh, production tonnage in the, in the EU and then the production tonnage in the rest of the world, and I'll tell you, that these rest of the world production numbers are low because we had a hard time getting disaggregated production data from South America where a lot of production of these types of cheeses takes place. So you'll see that uh, there is three times as much mozzarella produced outside of the EU as inside the EU, uh, f five, four times as much cheddar, uh, more Parmesan than uh, is produced in, in the EU, 15 times more provolone, and uh, at least as much feta. Now, as long as this issue is being fought out in uh, as sort of an academic or, or legal intellectual property issue in Geneva, context of the Doha Round negotiation, 
we were concerned, but we weren't losing a lot of sleep over the issue. But in recent years, it's become much more of a serious issue because it's beginning to have serious commercial consequences. Because the EU, in, previous, in, its, in its previous trade negotiations over the last three or four years, has been working very hard not just to register, its, use those trade agreements to, to gain a path to registration of its ge geographical indications, but very consciously to claw back the use of these common names to prevent other producers from other areas of the world use, and, and domestic producers from using those common names to describe the products that they produce. That's the, one of the remaining handful of issues in the negotiation between uh, the EU and Canada right now. And the EU has proposed very explicitly that, the, that Canada phase out the use of all of these common names. So it's not just a question of registering Parmigiano Reggiano or even Prosciutto di Parma. It's giving up, it's, it's changing the common names that, that uh, producers have used to describe their foods for generations. I don't know a single uh, producer in the U.S. wants to produce a market or product called Prosciutto di Parma or Parma ham. But there are a lot of producers who want to use the term prosciutto because that's recognized as a food type. If we were just talking about prosciutto di Parma, no problem. Uh, uh, let me give you an example of the serious adverse effects that, uh, that uh, clawback can have on producers, in, uh, in new world producers. I was in Brussels recently for a consultation with the Danish government and the Danish dairy board on their application for the registration of the name Danbo. Now, uh, there's very little U.S. production of Danbo. There may be none at all. It's not a common cheese here. Uh, but we were interested because uh, Danbo is a cheese for which there is a codex standard. You don't create a codex standard, a production standard, for a cheese that's produced just in one locality. The reason there's a codex standard is because there was worldwide production of Danbo. And uh, the producers, uh, and it was the Danish themselves that initiated the, uh, the push for a codex standard, uh, the, they wanted to ensure that there was a standard recipe. And so countries negotiated that and implemented the codex standard. But now the Danish dairy boards had a change of heart, and they're uh, applying for the protection of that name. We were joined in those consultations by representatives of the Argentine and Uruguayan government. There, they have significant produ production of Dambo cheese. And they only, don't only uh, consume it domestically, they export it throughout Latin America. And because of their marketing, Danbo is a common cheese name in much of Latin America, especially in South America. What their concern was is that not only is the EU going to register that cheese and protect that name in Europe, but they, through their trade agreements, are also going to uh, potentially protect that name in export markets. And then all of a sudden, Argentine producers, Uruguayan producers that have developed these markets in, in Latin America will lose the right to call their product by that name. Uh, I, I believe that it is entirely possible to grant appropriate protection to geographical indications without unduly disrupting marketing and trade. It's important that countries register only legitimate GIs, and here I'll, I'll uh, uh, say that I believe that, FET, that, that a name like FETA is probably, should probably not qualify under the definition of a legitimate GI. It has no geographical component. It is a, a cheese type that was produced in many countries around the world. We would have no objection at all to the registration in the U.S. of uh, the name feta as a part of a compound GI with a geographical component. We would even be happy to, to help develop a system that would facilitate that registration but we would object very strongly to the, to the registration of FEDA as a single term and the loss of the, the ability to use that, that uh, term domestically. Uh, it's, it's important to avoid, for countries to avoid registration of common names as single term GIs. There are a bunch of indicators you can look at to, to 
figure out whether or not uh, this name has become a common name and whether or not it's important for international commerce. You can look to see if there's a codex standard. You can look if, to, to uh, find if there are standards of identity in multiple countries around the world that have been developed. Uh, if there's specific production outside of the applicant region, significant international trade, if there are references to the product as a generic product in tariff schedules, and those are quite common in countries around the world. Let me just uh, give you a couple of examples of how the EU has squared this circle internally. Because the important thing in the end, for us this is a commercial re uh, issue, it's not a legal issue. And that's why I was careful to point out that we don't contest the, the right of producers to register GIs and we don't really care how countries do that as long as they take into account commercial realities. Emmental is a place in Switzerland. And that's where it, uh, a very, comp, very popular cheese originated. At the time that the EU started protecting geographical indications, Emmental was a cheese type that was produced in many places in the EU. Switzerland tried to register the name in the EU. The EU turned Switzerland down. Uh, they would not give Switzerland the exclusive right to use that name. And in fact, they registered uh, that uh, several geographical indications, compound indications containing the name Emmental. That's an intelligent approach. They recognized the commercial realities. They took them into account. They've since uh, registered, I believe, uh, a compound geographical indication for Switzerland that incorporates the name Emmental. Same thing with uh, Gouda and Adam cheeses. The Dutch government recently applied for protection of the terms Adam Holland and uh, Gouda Holland. And uh, we talked with them during the, that process. We filed a formal objection because we considered Gouda and Adam to both be generic terms. The Dutch government, uh, in a very enlightened way, recognized that fact. They uh, recommended to the commission that they include in the registration for some very specific language that made explicit that, uh, pro that producers from outside of the protected region could use those names, that they were protecting the compound appellation alone. That sort of an approach used worldwide uh, would, would be totally acceptable to us. So in, in this negotiation, I hope we can not only talk about uh, what is going to happen in the U.S. market under the, uh, under the TTIP agreement with respect to the protection of geographical indications, but uh, what happens in foreign markets as well, and what the, e the, the approach that the EU takes in its, in its uh, negotiations with other countries. Because, and this is my final point, because I realize I have exceeded my allotted time. Um, this, is, uh, this is not only, uh, th this is an issue that has global importance for the US, uh, US industry because we're in the position uh, the, now in a, number, in a number of countries around the world where these countries are on the verge of seriously impairing the value of concessions that they've made to the U.S. under trade agreements by granting exclusive use of these names to Europeans. Uh, we've had problems in Korea. That was where the problems first cropped up. We have serious problems now in Central America in Colombia and Peru. Potential, uh, the, where we have the potential for uh, uh, an impairment of the value of the concessions, those countries granted to us on cheeses and meat products because the Europeans are filing for protection of names and we are very suspicious about their intention with respect to common names. If those countries can clarify to us that they don't intend to uh, interpret the scope of protection for those geographical indications as extending to uh, important common names, we have no problem. If uh, they have agreed as a part of their uh, trade agreement with the EU to claw back, allow claw back of those common names, then we have a serious trade problem and we believe that those uh, countries have a basically a debt to the U.S. because they've impaired the value of important concessions that they've given to us. Now, uh, just in closing, I want to mention that there uh, is a new consortium that has been formed by uh, 
producer organizations and processor organizations that care about this issue. It's called the Consortium for Common Food Names. There's the URL if you're interested. Uh, but I'll close there. Look forward to your questions.